Hello chess fans. It's Craig Marr again. Bringing you another edition of Mastering the Middle Game. Um, let me be honest with you guys. I didn't, you know, I didn't get to 2400 because I had really terrific openings. In fact, most of my openings were really not, you know, of the um, really high caliber. You know, I try to keep my openings simple, and my philosophy was stay out of trouble in the opening, especially with black, where you can get into serious trouble if you make a mistake or inaccuracy. Um, the fact is, I really didn't like studying the opening that much, but I love to study the end game, and I kind of love to study the middle game. And there's too many players that uh, I believe they spend too much time studying the opening, and they don't get really get good at what really matters, and that is good middle game positional play and good middle game tactics. These are the very things that got me up to 2200, getting up to master, um, a long time ago. So it's all about mastering the fundament fundamentals of middle game tactics. Um, today what we're going to be learning about is patterns in the middle game. And one of the most important is the knight. What do I do with the knight in the middle game? We all know that in the opening you're going to be developing the knight out c3 or f3 and black can do the same thing. Develop the knight to f6, knight to d7. So the question is always going to be, now what do I do? And that's kind of the basic um, challenge for most beginning and intermediate players. What do I do with the knight after the opening is over? And one of the rules we're going to learn is knight on the rim is dim. Now, now in my opinion, that's really actually one of the one of the really bad rules to learn because there are times, as we're going to see in this game, where I had the black pieces against the grandmaster. Knight on the rim can be good. That goes completely contrary to this uh, middle game rule that uh, it's an old saying, but we cannot give this old saying much uh, value because it just doesn't work a lot of the time because when should we put our knight on the side of the board? Well, there are many times when there's a hole here, there's a hole here that we want to get into. And uh, that's one of the main reasons why sometimes we put the knight on the side or on the rim of the board. And in this game, you will see both players putting their knights on the side of the board. Um, so that's one of the rules we're going to learn and then all the exceptions to that rule. And um, so I don't want, I want you to be flexible in your thinking. I don't want you to say, I'm never going to put my knight 
on the side of the board, on the rim of the board. I don't want you to think like that. I want you to think, keep an open mind about what are my possibilities? If this is the rule, can I break that rule? And a lot of the rules in chess can be broken. And this is one of them. Now there are a lot of opening rules. They say, okay, knights before bishops, always castle early, um, never move the same piece twice, don't bring the queen out too early. But what we're going to really learn about the middle game and the opening is that there are always exceptions to every one of these rules. There are times when I'm going to move the same piece twice. There are going to be times when I develop the bishop before the knight. Um, but one rule in chess I always want you to follow and that is develop your pieces toward the critical area of the board. That applies on move 1, it applies on move 50. It almost always applies across the board. A lot of times one of the skills that we're going to learn in chess is to recognize a hot spot where is a lot of action going on and that is where you want to develop your pieces. Um, the other thing that we're going to be learning about today is to learn the value of the knight. See the knight has forking ability. That means it has the ability to let's say the queen is here to double attack both the king and the queen with a check and thereby winning material. So the fork is the main thing that we're going to focus on is the forking ability of the knight. Now let's kind of look at this diagram here and now let's say if black moves a queen up here dumbass move <laughs> Then I simply check with the knight and we can see that there's a fork and white wins the queen. And a lot of you at the beginning are going to fall for this kind of trap. And that's going to lose. Because when you lose your queen to a lower piece, you're going to lose the game. Now. A lot of you are not going to fall for the terrible queen d5. It's a dumb move. Instead, a lot of you are going to say, well, no, I'm not going to hang my queen. I'm going to put the knight on that square. Now I want you guys to take a moment to decide what is white's best move here. And okay, how many of you saw Queen takes Knight? He's got to take, because I've captured a piece. So he has to capture back. And now, here's the main point of white's combination. Now I have a knight fork. It's check. King moves up. And then voila, after I capture the queen, count up the pieces. Black, one, two, three. White, one, two, three, four. Four to three. White has won a piece and is going to be well on the way to winning the game. So that is how a knight fork works. 
Now you're probably wondering, you know, these masters or grandmasters that I play, they're so strong, they're not going to fall for that. Well, some of the skill in chess involves how can I set up a position where I'm going to force you into a knight fork, which you can't get out of. And that is kind of what happens in our featured game between myself and Grandmaster Sergei Kudrin, who was one of the uh, strongest players in the U.S. for many years in the 1980s and the 1990s. Sergey has largely retired now. You know, he's old like me. But uh, back in the day, and this game was played in 1986 at the World Open, we were both up-and-coming young players out to make our mark in the chess world. And at this time, my rating was 2490, so I needed 10 more points to try to get into the top 50 rated players in the United States. And Sergey was already an established grandmaster rated 2580. And my rating at the time at the tournament was somewhat underrated at 2430. But I really needed to win this game in order to vault into the top 50 players. I had the black pieces against Mr. Kudrin. E4 is your most aggressive move. And Sergei, in those days, was an E4 player. He still is an E4 player. And this was my uh, favorite defense in those days. I know that here for white, there are a lot of moves. You can play the King's Gambit. You can play the um, D4 immediately. You can play Bishop's Opening. But this knight f3, there's no question in my mind, this is absolutely white's best move. It develops a piece, prepares the castle, it's aggressive, and it's sound. So this is how I used to play uh, for a long time. Knight f6, Petrov, is very underrated defense. And it's just as good as knight c6. In fact, my first couple of years in chess, I played the Petrov exclusively but um, for whatever reason it, Petrov is not that popular you know but uh, it's a largely underrated defense now there are two moves here you have Bishop c4 and you have Bishop b5 which is better well I know that Fisher played this for most of his chess career so I think the Roy Lopez generally is White's best third move at this point Kudrin plays a little bit tricky. Now, for beginners and club players, this is White's most dangerous and tricky move. Because if Black, for example, plays here, you have the very dangerous knight. Uh, this is a primitive move, but it's very dangerous. And the number of tricks and traps that Black can fall under here is tremendous. So this is one of White's or Black's most sort of dangerous defenses. But here I'm going to show you the move that just completely pretty much um, ends all the cheapos and tricks pretty much. Well, it doesn't really end them, but it really cuts down on the number of you know dangerous ways. This is the best move by far. Fisher's move. You see, the attack is going to come on this weak f7 square. Notice that if you decide to come in here, I'm simply going to capture your knight. So that doesn't work. So let's say white 
somebody develops, and now I develop my knight, and then when you come in here, I simply castle out of danger, and then black is going to have no further problems in the opening. A lot of you are thinking, well, I can take knight f7, but this is not really going to lead to anything except a bad game for white because I take it and then you, you capture my rook and then I capture here and uh, the problem with this attack is you have no, no attack anymore because all your pieces are gone and black has a clear advantage. So you don't want to fall for this and uh, black is in perfect uh, safety at the end of all this so-called attack. So the main thing we want to avoid is not to give away all our pieces for a premature attack. So in this position it is, uh, it is white to move, and I believe that black has a solid type of uh, defense here. So Sergei played here, which is a little bit tricky. Uh, okay, now this is the move, because now, now knight f6, I simply castle, you know. So this is... Um, interesting here. Now look at this move. Look at this move. Now the main attribute of this move is to get me out of book. It's not really that good of a move, but I'm perplexed because I've never seen this move before. Bishop b6, I don't want to go bishop d6, feels so awkward. But this bishop b6 must be the best move. I played more conservatively bishop e7. Just trying to stay out of trouble here. Now here we're looking at kind of a Roy Lopez type position already. Um, this uh, pawn could be under attack now from b5, so I protect the pawn. And now we definitely have a very solid position for black, you know. You got a castle here to get your king out of the center. Because the center is about to open up here. Oops. All right, folks. That's it for now. But we will be continuing the rest of this game in part two. Thanks for watching. Thank you.